Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. I'm your host, the exceptional one, Ken McClinton. Joyce Malcolm is a professor of law at George Mason University School of Law, in fact, the Antonin Scalia School of Law. She is not only a tremendous lawyer in her own right, uh, dealing with constitutional scholarly issues specifically and developing um, a focus on individual rights and on war in society. Uh, she's a great and significant historian in her own right as well. Tonight she's representing SAVES Services. It is an organization that is focused on the intent to make certain that there is equality uh, for the accuser and the accused uh, on America's campuses and as well in educational settings. Without further ado, I want to introduce to some and present to others Ms. Joyce Lee Malcolm. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, ma'am. Well, thank you. I'm enjoying talking to you. It's great speaking with you. I, I bring this point to you tonight. Most Americans believe that the U.S. Constitution applies to every American across the country, no matter where we go, wherever we step, we are protected by this Constitution. Is that the case on America's college campuses, high schools, uh, elementary schools, even preschools? Um, unfortunately, uh, under the um, rules that have been in place since 2011, uh, it isn't really the case on college campuses for Title Title IX was introduced some years ago so there would be equality between the sexes in education. So it's really meaning for education and we know about it for uh, sports for men and women and so forth. Um, but in uh, 2011, um, concerns that women who were uh, had been harassed or sexually assaulted on campuses were being ignored or were afraid to come forward, uh, the Obama administration, um, led in this case by uh, Vice President Biden, um, felt that the rules needed to be changed on college campuses so that women would come forward more uh, readily um, to confront their accusers and that something would be done. And they issued something called a Dear Colleague letter. It wasn't um, an official law, it wasn't a, a real guide uh, regulation, it was just simply a letter. And the letter, you know, claimed that there was, rightly, that there was this issue, but then it insisted that the colleges had to do something about it, that they had to bring cases uh, and encourage these women to bring cases. Um, and they changed the standard for um, the accusation uh, and conviction instead of it being clear and convincing evidence that there had been some wrong done to this young woman or whoever complained, yes. um, they lowered it to the lowest possible standard that it was more likely than not that something had happened. And under those guidances, um, a, some woman who accused a young man of having assaulted her um, could go and get all kinds of help from administrators on the campus. The person she accused did not even necessarily get a written description or notice of this accusation, um, was not allowed to bring a lawyer or a counselor or any kind of help into a hearing, was not allowed to cross uh the person who had accused him, sometimes didn't even know what the accusation was. Yes. Um, so it was just a, they leaned so far over to help the woman that they ended up really taking away from the man, and that was mostly the case, a woman against them, a young guy, um, so that, you know, they completely trampled on his right to have some kind of fair hearing. And there were a great many uh, lawsuits, I should say, by the parents of these young men, because they, this would be on their records forever. There would yes. be these groups trying them. And, you know, this is on their record that they, you know, were a sexual assailant um, indefinitely uh, and kind of ruining their lives. Uh, and But the other thing about it was that this was just a guidance under the, uh, a letter, not a rule, a letter. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that letter, 
they threatened to take away from any college or university that did not follow their guidance all federal funding. So you can imagine that most universities were quite ready to go along under that kind of fear. Yeah. Uh, and, in, <laughs> and in fact, several cases were, there were something like 300 cases brought against universities did, that did not follow that guidance. No. So now we have, uh, you know, new rules that have been issued to try to make, you know, a change in that. And, now, you are a constitutional Secretary scholar, and right. I, I, I don't want to veer too far away from our conversation tonight, but I, I'm beginning to find uh, certain obsessions by bureaucrats uh, in terms of the estimation of their power and authority in the United States of America. You say a letter, a mere letter, was enough yes. to change Title IX. We're finding out their mere suggestions by the CDC was enough to shut down the entire economy. Is this an overreach by our bureaucracies or is this uh, under authority or, or, or a lack of authority by the Congress? Who is at fault for allowing this situation to evolve to this level? The Constitution doesn't really spell out very carefully emergency powers. I mean, certainly in a time of war, the president has the power to uh, commandeer some industries to do, you know, war work or do other things for the if people are, are under restrictions they aren't normally at. Yes. I think that, that this was seen as this terrible pandemic that was going to kill millions of people, and there didn't seem to be any guidelines. And there didn't seem to be a really clear understanding of how to get around it, how to fight it. And these governors have taken a tremendous amount of power. Yes. I couldn't believe it. <coughs> to shut people in their houses and and stop them from being able to work. I mean, there are millions of people who, who have no income anymore. So it, yes. it's, it's terrible. I you know, I, I can't say originally it was not done to do harm to people. But on the other hand, they now know that it that it did do harm, and that didn't. It wasn't really the awful disease that they thought it was going to be. Yes. So I think it's you know I'm ready to break out. To be exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. But there are a lot, but there are a lot of people that have been so frightened uh, by it. Um, in Virginia, for instance, we've had something like 38 deaths per million population. I mean, my God. I think probably that many people drown in the bathtub. <laughs> exactly. <know>. Exactly. <laughs> now, when we speak to this, many people say, well, you're not taking these issues as seriously as we are. But has Congress allowed, have the state legislatures allowed individuals to go further, to take on powers and authorities? that shouldn't be rested in their hands? Uh, and, and when you say a letter was enough to change Title IX, heck, a paragraph must be enough to change the Constitution. What's going on here? Who has the authority it's to really handle Title IX? It, it's really frightening the, the, um, the leeway that has been allowed uh, for governors to um, impose all kinds of restrictions. I mean, churches are shut down and yes. liquor stores are open. I mean, <laughs> where is the balance? And, he, and in some places, even church members sitting in their own individual cars on the church parking lot are arrested for being there. I mean, um, there, there's a lot of bias in what's happening, um, yes. you know, with the whatever the, the, the attitudes are of the people in charge. Um, one of the things that I applaud is that um, there's some sheriffs and people who simply say this is violating people's rights. I'm not going to enforce it. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I, there's going to be a reckoning, but it just shows that I think under certain circumstances where people are fed a, a lot of fear, um, the government can get away with doing these things. And, and, and there are a lot of people that even though there are only 38 per million dying in Virginia, um, who will stay home. You know, yes. they don't want to go back. And in the case of and Title IX, 
there are those who right. believe um, that the that the college is the lone arbiter in their justice uh, or, or or the pursuit of human right. And you have a lot of men, and we had a gentleman who graduated from college from Savannah State a few weeks back on our program who spoke about how he was three weeks away from graduating from college and someone accused him of a sexual assault that he never did and it was enough just the accusation to get him thrown off of campus and not be able to graduate. These are very serious strifes upon the American people. What did this administration do this week that makes Title IX any more different than it was just a few weeks back? Well, the, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, after a year and a half of study and um, thousands of comments, uh, has issued some new guidelines. And unlike the letter that imposed this very loose standard, uh, this is very thoughtful, and it is law. It is law. They can't just wipe it away. And basically, it provides for the presumption of innocence. It provides that to pr it protects the accused and the accuser so that they both have the right to know what the accusations are, to have an open hearing, to get counsel, um, to be able to cross-examine uh, each other. I mean, that the people that don't like the change are saying, well, this is throwing women to the, you know, the dogs and God knows what will happen, and you know it's back to the bad old days. Um, but their rights are being protected. It's yes. just that they're equal rights now, and I think that's so important. I, I really applaud her for having done this. Now, the former pre vice president of the United States of America, Joseph Biden, yes. um, who is a scholarly attorney of his own right, in his own mind, uh, basically stated that what Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump have done with Title IX uh, is to literally take away the right of women to pursue justice on America's campuses. And that if he became president, it would be one of the first things that he would uh, eliminate or at least write in terms of the way he sees the law. Uh, are, are we having an imbalance? Is there something wrong with what Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump have done with Title IX here? I think what they've done is to provide equal rights for men and women for the person who's accused and their accuser. The women are, anybody who makes a, a serious complaint uh, will be taken seriously and there's a much stricter guidelines for what colleges can do and how they do it. I mean, they still have to do something but they, they have to provide certain process, due process, that treats both sides fairly uh, so that there isn't this kind of imbalance that, you know, the woman is always to be believed. Or, um, that's terrible. And it, it's sort of ironic coming at this moment from um, the former Vice President Biden because he would be benefited from this. Um, and he was one of the, he was the prime actor in imposing that dear colleague letter. Yes. Um, so it's sort of, it's ironic, but it, Betsy DeVos and the, the Trump administration have been really careful, taking their time with this, uh, trying to hear all sides and be sure to protect both men and women and make sure that they, that the process is fair. They also are much more careful about what constitutes sexual harassment because there have been cases where somebody was accused of harassment, some guy for putting his hand on a woman's head. <laughs> yes. Literally, a case of that. Another yeah. one who just touched a, a woman's elbow to move her aside because he needed to get by. I mean, there, were, there was a lot of injustice done. And yeah. now it has to be a much more serious offense. It can't just be, you know, somebody was annoyed at somebody else and so they accused them of harassing them. Ms. Malcolm, are, are colleges more liable now as a result of such accusations? Are they going to be required to put in certain protocols to make certain that there is equal justice under the law? Yeah, they are going to be required to, but, it, but they already have a process. They just need to make it fair. They just need to notify someone who's been accused 
in writing of what they've been accused of wow. and allow them to bring in an, an attorney, you know. So I think they just need to modify it. But they now have huge bureaucracies that are sort of devoted to helping, you know, the accuser. And they need to realize that that all these students need to be helped. And in, in any situation like that, people must be treated equally. When you had those students reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, it was liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Exactly. And that kind of rang through, and I was thinking about this. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Ms. Malcolm, and, and final thought on this particular matter, because I have a sneaky question for you on the second part of it. But okay. if, if there is some young man who's going to college this semester, and he just happens to bump into a young lady uh, in the elevator while he's trying to put his bedding and everything in place in his room uh, as he comes on campus for the summer. What should be the first thing he does in order to protect himself from the accusation of sexual assault? I would say if you bumped into her, I excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> first thing. That's the first thing. Say excuse first, me. But the, second, <laughs> but the second thing is that he now will know that there will be some kind of fair procedure if anybody makes an accusation. I used to worry about the parents of young men yes. going off to college. I mean, these are what, 18 year olds? And their whole lives can be ruined by somebody who misunderstands or the, who gets angry at them. So now there will be a process. And I think that they can feel a lot more confident that, um, that there will be justice for all. That's what my hope is. You are a tremendous constitutional scholar, and you have been quoted at the Supreme Court even. And we thank you so much for being with us tonight. But here's the sneaky question here. Uh, by, the letter written, <laughs> by the letter written by Joseph Biden, who was vice president at the time, would okay. he have been found guilty of sexual assault on America's college campuses? based on the Tara Reid situation that he has right now. Yeah, I should say he didn't write the letter, but he was responsible for it. Yeah, I think he, obviously, uh, you know, that accuser would be believed. He would not have, he wouldn't know exactly what he was supposed to have done. I mean, he would benefit from these new rules, but he, <laughs> that he wants to erase if he becomes president. So well, maybe uh, we should erase you know, the rules I think for him right great now. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Malcolm, thank you so much. This, I hope to get you back because I do want to talk with you about your work on the Second Amendment and as well your book uh, and that Peter, it, Peter's what, what is the name of the book? Peter's War. Peter's War. And there I've we go. one on Benedict. Right. Okay. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great pleasure to talk with a great constitutional scholar, uh, Ms. Joyce Lee Malcolm. Uh, she is at Antonin Scalia School of Law uh, on the campus of George Mason University. She's a constitutional law professor there. We've been talking about the Title IX changes uh, that have taken place as a result of the work of Donald Trump and Betsy DeVolts, uh, and as well, it's amazing it, it, the hypocrisy of those who are on the left it just it's almost it, it, it's so novel that it's not even stunning anymore but former vice president Joe Biden who was responsible for or, or at least the oversight of the letter which changed title nine if he went by his own standard would be found guilty of sexual assault with Ms. Tara Reid and the seven other women who have brought charges against him. Can you imagine that same man right now wants to take away your basic liberty and freedoms which have just started on America's campuses as a result of the change? Congratulations, Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education and President Donald Trump on your work on this issue. There's still room for improvement as always, but we are far better ahead than we were before. We'll be back, ladies and gentlemen, in the second quarter of our program. You are watching Open Heart Closed Case Night uh, of the Exceptional Conservative Show. We are certainly a great republic, 
And we are the best in urban conservative talk, news, and movies. We will be right back right after these messages. <laughs> Coffee is like a fine wine, and today we're headed to the Royal Kona Coffee Center to see how it goes from the volcanic slopes to one of the top ranked coffees in the world. Kona Coffee has a very bold and unique aroma and flavor profile that's unlike any other coffee in the world. We've got rich soil running up and down the hills throughout Kona. We also have some of the